Well, we're about to begin a great adventure. My name is Bruce Dick, and it is my privilege to be your teacher for the next little while to study two books of the Bible that are of great passion and great interest and great application for me and the church in which I serve. And I trust that it will be for you as time goes on. I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about who I am and my family and my life. I told you my name. My name is a good German name. My ancestors are German who came to America after spending some time in Russia due to some persecution there. So I have a great love for your country. Um, my family grew up in North Dakota, which is one of the northernmost states in the United States of America. It borders Canada. So oftentimes we would in the summer go into Canada on fishing trips. So that is a country that was closest to us. I grew up on a farm. My parents, my grandparents were farmers in North Dakota and I grew up with a great love for the farm. We had dogs and cats and we didn't have cattle or any other kind of livestock. We were grain farmers. We raised wheat, uh, barley, uh, oats, flax, small grains, things like that. And I remember as a boy so many times just going on adventures in the backyard, in the trees, um, playing. My brother, I have one brother and two sisters. My brother is two years younger than me. And we would have so many adventures that we would go on in our backyard and play, inventions to make and create things in, our, in my father's shop. Uh, I had two sisters. One is eight years younger than eight things in our in my five years younger than I am, and love them both. Um, my parents right now are a little over seventy years old. They are retired, and all of my siblings and my parents moved to a different state. They live in the state of Nebraska. So I'm the only one of my family that still lives in North Dakota. Well, as I was growing up and loved the farm, I thought that when I grew up, God was going to let me be a farmer. That's what I wanted to be. And so I learned what I could, and I, I did what many of my friends did, and what some of you have done, and that's attend a Bible college after I got done with high school. And for four years, I attended Bible college and enjoyed that, enjoyed the study, enjoyed the relationships. I played on the college basketball team. I wasn't a very good basketball player, but I was a hard worker and a good defender and a part of some amazing experiences, and God has used them to shape my life even to this day. But it was my junior year in college where I, I met a, a new pastor. He had come to my home church in North Dakota. He had just graduated from seminary and we began a relationship. I was just very young and he was right out of seminary and he said, Bruce, I think that one day you should be a pastor. And I said, I don't want to be a pastor. I want to be a farmer. And he said, no, you have something in you that you're a teacher. And I, I had been teaching Sunday school since I was about 13 years old. I had a love to teach and, and love people and love teaching. And he said, Bruce, I, I think you should consider seminary when you're done with Bible college. And I said, yeah, maybe. And he says, I know where you should go. And he recommended the seminary that he had attended in Dallas, Texas. It was in my junior year of college where um, I said, maybe I should see if this is what God wants. And so I, I got an application for this seminary and I thought, they're never going to accept me. They want future pastors in their school. I'm going to put on there, I want to be a farmer. And so they, I'm sure that they won't accept me. But I filled out my application in my junior year and it took a number of months and it was very difficult to get into this seminary. So I thought, yeah, that's fine. I'm just going to go home and farm. Well, a few months later, I came back it was now the fall of my senior year of college and I got a letter in the mail and it said, we'd like to welcome you as a future student of our seminary. And I go, wow, this is really going to happen. And so after I graduated from college, um, I started the next fall in seminary in Dallas, Texas. I still didn't think I was going to be a pastor. In fact, I only chose the two-year degree program because I thought, I just want to know more about the Bible. I just, I just want to know more and then I'm going to go home and farm. And so I, I was there for two years and loved it and met some wonderful people that today I still correspond with and have such great memories of those days in seminary. It was so deep and it was so rich and we read so much and our interaction was so great. I just loved every minute of it. But when I graduated from seminary, I went home and did what I wanted to do. I went home to farm. Um, I went home to farm with my father and my uncle and my grandfather and my brother. So there were five of us in one 
kind of collective operation. And a few years later, my cousin joined us when he got old enough to be a farmer. And I loved it. I, I was having the best, best of both worlds. I, um, I farmed during the week and I often preached in churches on the weekends. So when, when pastors would find out that there was a seminary trained farmer in the community, they would say, well, I'm going on vacation. Would you like to come preach in my church? And I would say, sure. So I probably preached in 20 or 30 different churches in rural North Dakota, met many different people. I even had a chance to help plant a church. Uh, a church was starting about 30 miles from my hometown and they said, we would like you to be the pastor of this church for the first six months until we can hire a pastor. And I said, uh, okay, that sounds fun to me. And I was still farming and so the years went by. I was still single. I was not yet married. And um, in, the, in those times, I met a, a wonderful young lady by the name of Trudy. And uh, she and I dated briefly at one period in time. And then she went on to college and I was a bit older than she was and she had some things she wanted to learn and do. And a few years later, God brought us back together. By then she had graduated from college and she was serving in a ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. And our relationship kind of rekindled and we began to think about what marriage would be like. And in 1992, Trudy and I were married and returned to the family farm. And she has this great heart for discipleship and missions. And she had traveled to different places in the world to serve. And so we began our married life together. We have four children today. Our oldest, her name is Michaela, and she's 16 at the time that we're doing this recording. She's a wonderful gift from God. When she was born, you know, you have all the nervousness of being a first time parent. And um, there's so many stories in our family that I'll share with you over time, but I'll give you the short one now. When she was three and a half months old, she was not growing very fast. And she was, um, I'm not sure how to describe her, fussy. Uh, she was agitated many times. And we took her to the doctor and he couldn't find anything wrong. We took her to another doctor. He couldn't find anything wrong. Finally, we noticed something that when she, when she would cry, her lips would turn blue. And we said, something is wrong. Or when she would uh, nurse, when she would suck on a bottle, her lips would turn blue. And we said, this is not normal. And some ladies in the church noticed that when, when she would cry, her chest would move up and down very fast, not normal. So we returned to a, a different specialist doctor and, and he listened to her hard and he couldn't hear anything wrong. And he says, Mr. and Mrs. Stick, we, we will just admit your daughter and do some tests. Well, we hadn't planned to stay, so I went home. And while I went home to get some clothes, my wife called with the test results and said, your daughter has an enlarged heart. It was very large on one side and very small on the other side. And they said, things are not connected the way they need to be. And so we need to do open heart surgery on your daughter. And we're like, we're first time parents. We don't know anything about this. And so she had to be flown by air ambulance to a different hospital in a far city. And we drove down and we cried and we prayed and our church was praying. And a few days later, she had surgery to reconnect some of the veins to her heart that weren't connected to the right place. And today she's healthy and strong. She plays violin. She's very athletic. She sings. She has a beautiful voice. And we just think God's grace is so amazing in her because what we, a couple of things we realized when she was having this trouble, number one, she, she was not getting enough oxygen. They, they put a little light on your finger that measures how much oxygen is in your body. It should be saturated like 98%. And hers was in the low 80%. She could have had brain damage. And she's very intelligent. She gets all A's on all of her tests. And we just say, thank you, God, for your, your gift of grace. And so she's, uh, she's about to become uh, 11th year student in high school. We have two boys. Uh, Landon is, in a couple of days, going to be 14. We're going to miss his birthday when we're here. So we celebrated a little bit before we left. And he is going to enter the eighth grade. Um, he, he likes to run. He's very successful in track uh, and running. Uh, he plays guitar. Um, he's probably our most energetic boy. He has lots of emotion and lots of passion. Then there's Chandler. He is 12. He's going to enter the seventh grade. He plays violin. He is the son who is most like his father, like me. He is very competitive. I am very competitive. 
Uh, I love to play any sport. Uh, you invite me. Last night we, we were out at one of the camps and the kids were playing volleyball. I jumped in to play volleyball. Chandler is just like me. Uh, he, he's very smart. He does very well in school and uh, he, he is a joy. And then our youngest, uh, her name is Sasha, which is obviously a Russian name, Alexandra. And she's eight and we adopted her from Russia in 2003 when she was almost two years old. So she's eight now. In uh, November, we will celebrate, I have to do the math in my head, she'll turn nine, seven years that she's been with us. And we adopted her from the city of Perm, if any of you are familiar with that. Just an amazing adventure. Uh, God really tested our faith. Uh, one of the reasons that we decided to adopt was, I had come here in 2001 and 2002 to teach, and I, I just fell in love with the Russian people. I really did. I had such a great time. Uh, I enjoyed every moment that I was here. And it was as if God planted a seed in my mind. He said, Bruce, if you love these Russian people, what would you think of maybe adopting one of their children into your family? But God also did something else in me. Um, my wife and I had talked about how many children we would have, and we had three. And um, we had talked about adoption a little bit from time to time, but nothing real serious. And it was as if God said to me, Bruce, I'm planting this idea in your mind, but do not tell your wife. I'm like, why? <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't say anything. At the same time, God was doing a work in my wife, Trudy. And one day I came home from church and uh, she was crying. And I said, oh no, did I do something wrong again? And I said, what's wrong? And she said, <laughs> I got this video about Russian adoptions and I'm, I want to adopt a baby from Russia. And I said, wow. And it was as if, it, it was as if God said, now tell Trudy what you've been thinking. It's very special to us. And I said, I have something to tell you that I believe God wants us to adopt from Russia too. And so that began the journey. And the reason God used that so powerful was that there were times of great agony in the process of adopting. It was very slow and the people who were trying to help us on the American side were very slow and we were like, God, are we supposed to do this? And that affirmation, that conviction that we were supposed to adopt was so strong that it, it helped us endure those times of wondering what we should do and when we should do it. And two years after we started the process, Alexandra came into our home. She was almost two years old when we adopted her. And uh, she didn't talk at all, so she doesn't know Russian. We tell her a few Russian words, but we don't know very many Russian words either. But the one word that, that she enjoyed in the orphanage was the word for frog. So we know the word for frog, lagushka. They say, Sasha, Lagushka, Lagushka. <laughs> so we don't know very many Russian words, but as we were preparing for this trip, I said, Sasha, we're going back to Russia. Are you going to my Russia? Well, we're not going to your town, but we're going to a different town. And so we talk about Russia with her many times. Her favorite activity with me is when we tuck her in bed at night, or when I put her to bed at night, she'll say, Daddy, tell me a Russia story. I say, okay. So I will, I, uh, I'll say, Sa and so I'll have this, this voice like this, Sasha, let me tell you what it was like when we saw you for the first time. And she lays in bed and her eyes are real big, like, and she just listens the whole time. And so, you know, maybe once a week, I'll, I'll tell her a little part of the Russia story, something in the orphanage or something when we met her, or when she got her passport pictures and she's learned to talk uh, she, she's learning English. She finished the first grade. She will go into second grade next year. And um, she's a joy. We're still finding out what her gifts are. She loves to sing. She likes to dance and very acrobatic. Um, but we're going to see what gifts God has in her. Uh, so that's our family. And our, Trudy's parents are helping take care of them while we're gone. Uh, but let me complete the story about how God directed us to this work. I told you that I farmed. Well, in 1997, uh, my father, my brother, and I all decided that we would no longer farm. 
conditions were very difficult for farming at that time. And so we all decided that we would quit farming. And so Trudy and I began to look for a church that might be interested in having us come. And it was at that time where 40 miles from where we were farming, a church was opening up a new position, an associate pastor position. And so we applied for that position and we became that church's first associate pastor in October of 1997. And that's where we've been since that time. God has really challenged me as a pastor. I began as an associate pastor and a year later I became the senior pastor of that church when the senior pastor left. And so I've been doing preaching for all of these years, learning, growing. Um, I, I think the thing that I learned about being a pastor is that there is always more to learn. There's always room to improve and to grow, whether that be in preaching or in counseling or in leading people, providing leadership. Um, there are times when I say, Lord, I want to farm again. Please take me away from this church. I don't like this anymore. And there are times where I say, Lord, this is the greatest job in the world. Thank you for making me a pastor. And I just want to be honest with you that uh, if God calls any of you to be at work in full-time ministry, it will be the greatest challenge and the greatest blessing you will ever encounter. And I don't think that that matters whether you're in Russia or the United States or anywhere. Um, but God has given me so many opportunities to teach and to preach and to share and so it's just a joy to be with you here. Uh, each of the four times that I've been here, I have taught a course called How to Study the Bible. I love that course more than anything that I teach because to have a chance to sit down with people and say, if you've never studied the Bible before, or even if you've tried to just read it, did you know that God has, uh, wants you to understand it. And so we walk through the basic tools that, that anyone can learn to help understand what a particular passage means or what a whole book says. And so it's just a privilege to, to have been able to share that. And so this is my first chance to actually share the study of a couple of books of the Bible with you, which is what we're going to do with First and Second Timothy. And these are a couple of books that I have studied and preached through in my home church and I am very excited to share with you. And I think there is so much application that you're going to see uh, whether, you are, um, whether you are students, whether you are working in your church, whether you're even a pastor. I think that the principles here cross cultural lines. I think they cross eras of history. I think that the principles that we're going to learn and the study that we have uh, have great application to virtually anywhere in the world and especially in God's church right here and now. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. So what I'd like to do is to transition from talking about who I am and what my past and present is like, is to kind of work our way through the syllabus. I've prepared a very simple syllabus uh, about what we're going to be studying, and I just want to walk through that with you for a little bit. And I have to call that up here in my documents. The description says simply this, it is designed to provide the students with pastoral and exegetical insights into two of the three pastoral epistles. Now, first and second Timothy, are two of the three pastoral epistles. Titus is the third one. We won't be studying that book with you this time. But the focus is going to be on understanding the meaning of these letters as well as giving practical and pastoral insights to assist the student in their personal application as well as those with whom they will share what they learn. My goal is not simply to be an academic teacher. My goal is that when you leave this, this study you will say, I can see now how that might apply in my church. I can see how that might apply in my family. I can see how that works in my life. Uh, I love word study. So a lot of what I share with you will have to do with the meaning of words. Uh, so we'll talk about this word means this and it could mean this in another context. But this is why Paul chose to use it here. And so my prayer is that the things that you learn, and every one of you is going to take different things away that I think will be helpful to you in no matter what way God allows you to serve. Our, our objectives are four, and they are these. First, to gain an understanding of the overview of both 1st and 2nd Timothy based on a synthetic approach to Bible study. 
So a synthetic study looks at the overview. I, I call it the umbrella. If you were to create an umbrella and underneath that is First and Second Timothy, you would get an overall understanding of what the book is about. And that's what we want to help share with you. And that's what we're basically going to do today. I'm going to share a lot about the background. And that becomes our second course objective. It's to understand the background and the context of First and Second Timothy as an aid to understanding the meaning of each letter. I'll talk more about this later, but uh, you may be frustrated by the end of our first day together. You say, isn't he ever going to study the book itself? Uh, what we're going to do together is actually get deeply into the background of who is Paul, who is Timothy, where is Timothy, why is he there, where's Paul when he writes this letter, what's happening in their lives. Um, as I said, I'll tell you more about this later. But I want you to imagine that we're building a new home. And when you build a new home, at least in America, I have some friends of ours are building a home. You don't begin by simply building a house on top of the ground. You dig a hole in the ground. You create cement footings on which the foundation is going to stand. You begin to build the cement walls underneath the ground and then the house is built on top of that. We're going to work on background quite a bit this morning so that we understand what's behind the books of First and Second Timothy. So that was objective number two. Objective number three says to encourage and demonstrate the discipline of analytical Bible study as a means of interpreting the message of First and Second Timothy. Now analytical study means that we look at the details. Remember synthetic is the umbrella. That's the big picture. Analytical looks at the different pieces. So what we're going to do is take sections of 1 Timothy and sections of 2 Timothy and analyze them and study the words and look at application and, and go in that way. And then the fourth objective is simply this, to provide practical and pastoral insights and illustrations to assist in both personal and church-wide application of 1 and 2 Timothy in local contexts. So what we're going to do, as I said before, is um, I'm going to tell stories. Uh, I love to tell stories. I say, you know, I was looking at this verse and it occurred to me that it might have this kind of meaning in this particular context. So I'll say something about my family or something about our church. And I hope that when I do that, you will, you will leave and say, ah, I understand that. That's what that looks like because maybe I gave you an example. And you can feel free to borrow my examples or maybe it will trigger a thought where you say, oh, okay, I know what that means now. Uh, I know what that, I know an example of that in my context. So uh, other than that, we're going to spend time just talking and interacting with the, the two books of First and Second Timothy. So I, I think that that's probably enough for just the overview of where we're going to start. Uh, that's a little bit of who I am. It's a little bit of the syllabus and what we expect to accomplish over the time of our study together. And I think we'll, uh, we'll get into the background in a couple of minutes after we take a short break. So thank you. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com. 